Hello, 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 everyone. It's Kate Richburg, and it is time for Bead Shop Live this Wednesday. It's great to have you all here. Uh, we're broadcasting out onto a myriad of social media uh, platforms. So I want to say hello to everybody on the createwithbeadshop.com group, the bead table, um, the great bead extravaganza facebook page and youtube channel and of course our bead shop youtube channel so before we get into it you guys i wanted to just remind you that you can follow us right here at beadshop.com on our instagram instagram is a great place to follow us for inspiration as well as sneak peeks of what's coming up that's one of drea's favorite things uh to create some sneak peeks on our insta um as well as uh you can find our bead shop group on facebook called the bead table we'd love to have you join us and now right now before we get started if you're watching us on our youtube channel go ahead and click that like and subscribe button uh, so you don't miss any comment we'd love it if you give us that like and if you're watching us on facebook um, any of those channels, we'd love it if you'd share it out to your social feed to get as many beaters into the fold as we can. So uh, that being said, let me get rid of this banner. And there I am. It's great to see everybody on this Wednesday morning, at least for us out on the West Coast. It is Wednesday, uh, March 24th. And as you know, we have a special guest today returning. You know, um, Emily, uh, if you've been watching, let me scoot a little closer in, uh, extreme close up. There we go, extreme close up. Now let me back up. There we go, that works. Um, if you've watched the history of our beadshop.com live broadcasts on Wednesdays and Fridays, you know that for a period of time, I had Janice sitting to my, well, it was actually to my, right but it looks this is the right way to <laughs> do it i think on the on the broadcast um so i did a lot of them with janice and then emily came on board and we did a lot of live broadcasts together on wednesdays so if you're new to watching us or if you need some refreshers um emily is very skilled at all things seed beads so if you go back through amongst other things wire and she's supine super multi-talented seed beads isn't her only gig. Um, and so you can um, go back and watch some of those older broadcasts. Uh, our hair may be a little longer and maybe a little less gray, but you know what? Age comes to all of us. So uh, you can watch some of those um, on repeat uh, if you'd like. And our YouTube channel is the best place to watch those. So again, click that like and subscribe button um, so you have all that content there. So Emily is waiting in the wings. So I'm going to unmute her. Hey, Em, I can, whoops, let me, I meant to unmute you there. There we go. Oh, Em, I think you need to unmute yourself because I think you are muted. There we go. I think I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I can. I can. I can. So let me get you on this screen. There cool. you are, Emily Miller. Hi, Kate Richburg. It's nice to see you. It's good to see you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. You know, uh, muddling through this pandemic lifestyle and um, itching for it to be done, but masking up and washing my hands and I got my first yeah. uh, ouchie ouchie just the same day as you did so yeah it's great the next one until we can kind yeah. of hug our families again I'm looking really looking forward to that yeah and you know um going right along yeah so, so. you have a couple of places uh you've been doing so uh chit chat a little bit bring us up to speed because we haven't seen you for a while and right. i know that you have um an instagram is probably the best place for people to follow you em is that right yeah. yep um, um why don't you fill us in on what you've been doing lately well i have for the past two years been working on doing more selling of my jewelry which was never a big priority for me before because mm -hmm. i was teaching so much and that just didn't kind of come into it. Um, although when you teach, you build up a very large collection of jewelry. <laughs> right. You never can wear it all. And and 
Um, so I've been focusing on doing more selling lately and that's been going very well, which I really enjoy. I do uh, right now with a lot of event shows that are um, not happening, you know, outlets that we use to craft shows and um, different right. kind of, um, seasonal events that would come along, come our way. Those aren't happening. So I've been focusing on working at the farmer's market in Midtown Sacramento. And that's been going really well. I have also been selling at the Folsom Market in the town of Folsom, which is close to where I am as well. But mm -hmm. uh, Midtown Sacramento has kind of become my my home away from home. And oh, I schlep all my stuff down there Saturday morning real early in the dark. And I meet up with a bunch of other crazy artist types. And we all set up tents together. And um, it's kind of fun. It's another kind of community, you know. Um, um, there's uh, the guy who sells the pickled onions, who's a couple doors down for me, and the leather wallet guy, and there's a t-shirt guy, and a lady who makes tote bags, and Tanya, my friend, who does um, watercolors, and oh, uh, great! It's, it's, it's really fun. Um, and we set up, and we uh, have our own little event there every Saturday for a few hours, and then we break it all down and empty the street out again. Um, it's and it's the Midtown Farmers Market yes. on Saturdays. Is that okay. right? Yep, it's Emily. on 20th between J, K, and L in Midtown. Okay, Sacramento. I'm gonna go ahead. I just found this, so I'm gonna. I'm yes, gonna, they have a, they, uh, have a um, they have an Instagram as well. So there we go, and, and you can find food and the market is yeah. really great. So it's a nice, it's a really nice one. It's very um, well organized and well kept. Um, the market manager Lisa, is a, a wonderful lieutenant out there. She's has a crew and she marshals her people and gets them to do all the stuff and um, oh, great. circulates through during the day. So she's good fun. Um, oh, it's great. Yeah, no, it, it's a great little market. You're great. In the well, I put it up. I put it up on the screen so people Thank can find you. you. Thank you. So, I will get better at keeping up on my Instagram. I tend to go with little right. stops like we all do. Right. Right. So, but I have but, some new plans uh, for Instagram. So. Um, oh, good. I'm really excited yeah. to see that. Yeah. And you're doing some stamping and things, right? You do some I actual am. jewelry making yeah. right there at the farmer's right market, which is live. Kind of cool. A little bit of live theater ha happening at the yeah. market. Yeah. Um, oh, I like that story. You know, my brother used to be a, a market operations manager at the Marin Farmer's Market over in Marin. Oh. Hill. He did that for a few years, and he, he often likened it to setting up a little bit of live theater. You know, you sort of had to think about how people were going to enter and exit the, the, the stage and um, you know, how the, the cast of characters were there. And it's, it's very interesting um, that we get to do that and break it down in one day. Um, yeah. I, it's I, like you put on a show and then you take it all back to the barn yeah. or and everybody, everybody, yeah. everybody, everybody does their little origami um, uh, Rubik's cube of stuff going back into their vehicle and there's lots right. of different vehicles there too. Um, there's a couple of folks who have, uh, who are, I'm very envious of who have trucks sort of like a food truck. Uh, do they have a pan? Do they, anybody with a panel van? You know how I love a panel van. It's like a chip truck or a UPS truck kind of yeah. truck. But it's yeah. Full of plants. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh. um, yeah, the plant company comes and they op throw open their doors and they have a little set of stairs. You can go inside the van and look at plants and then they have plants outside. And then there's a, a really crazy guy named John who does fun T-shirts and tote bags and some earrings and socks. Oh, and he also fun. has a little a little mini transit that is outfitted oh. with stuff where you can throw open the doors and it's all right there. Um, oh, so, yeah, that's really cool. have um and a little bit of van envy. <laughs> van envy. I know you and me both, Sam. You and me both. I keep my well, eyes out. I think. A little bus. <laughs> right. A little right. You never know. Um, well, it's really exciting to have you here with this project. And I've got some samples here, and I know that you've got some samples that you're going to be showing. But yeah. this is kind of, and I should have actually worn these today, but this is kind of the continuation of our lantern airing that you did a while back, right? And you know, um, I forget who that was who encouraged me i'm not going to say pestered but she brought it up to me several times that this needed to be yeah. a 3d piece to really make it a lantern and you mm -hmm. know it's funny it, creatives you know you have to take your time things things don't always happen on everyone's schedule it takes a little minute right you need to let it muddle it needs to, it needs to marinate a little bit in there um, yeah 
And the more I looked at these, and I actually, to remind myself, I had my incomplete versions of that out on my work table while I was working on other things, and I kept having to move them around. And, um, it definitely gave me some inspiration, but it kind of gave me the the time to think about the mechanics of how this was going to all work. And, you know, right. CB and, and wire kind of have that in common is that there's a lot of mechanics that go into it that you, when you're going to come up with something new where you're going to use a different, turn something more, something you've already made into something different, you really have to kind of think about those mechanics all over again. You start sort of from scratch, right. but I did yeah, keep this and sort of similar to that first one. So for the learning part yeah. of this, you guys can refer back to the handouts for that. And also the, the brick stitch diagram pages would be very handy. Yeah. For this and so I put up right here, you can see this is from our beadshop.com website. So you can find all of these here. And this is the brick stitch earring page that I just flashed mm -hmm. up. So if you go to um, beadshop.com and you go to the seed bead school section of what we have under learning, this has a lot of your, um, your brick stitch earrings that you did, and mm -hmm. then the lantern earrings, the Tokyo lantern and the Shanghai right. lantern. And then there's a recipe so you can kind of, again, choose your own adventure with that. So um, if you're new to any of these kind of brick stitch or, you know, probably this lantern earring right. would be a great first place yeah. to jump in and sure. then maybe, maybe move to these guys here. Well, um, this, you were also a driver on this project a little bit because mm -hmm. we kind of were talking, we were kicking around ideas about what was happening still with Seed Beat School and kind of where we mm -hmm. were in the in the process. And I, I feel like really, how many years have, we been do have you been doing this, Kate? Remind me. Um, we're in our fifth year. I mean, we passed right. our fourth anniversary. So we well, are- I remember, we I remember are... talking to you and JP about Seed Beat School early on. And I, I feel like I mm -hmm. made a list of Pro, a, a list of techniques that I thought we needed to cover. And one mm -hmm. of the techniques that was in there was fringing. And we do talk yeah. about fringe in a bunch of different places, but this was kind of driving, this was a driver for, for getting us into that fringe discussion as well to yeah. make sure folks had some information about how they might go about picking fringe or some inspiration about things that they haven't seen before. Um, of course we do textured fringe, which is what I've got on right here. Um, in right, a necklace beautiful. Form. That's so beautiful. Right? Very beachy and and of the of the season. Now we're getting back to summer and um and and earrings, brick stitch earrings, which have I'm loving to see have made a big renaissance. Have a bunch of opportunities for for fringes. Um, yeah, and it can be something that can be super simple or it can be very highly embellished and very complicated. It's your it's your bag. Yeah. Your your choosing your own adventure again. And I think what we're what we're doing with this broadcast, and I'm going to put this one up here real quick. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do with this broadcast is you're going to be broadcasting today and showing us how we do this lantern section. Right. Now, this lantern, um, you could, and I'm going to put this on here. This is from the beadshop.com website. So if you go, you can see right here on the... Um, uh, on the screen, there's up on the top banner, it says live shows. A great way to find that is if you go to live shows, click on that and you'll see the date today. You'll see the the, the lantern lariat here and it'll take you to this page. Under project info, you can't see it because I can't scroll, but there's kind of a basic recipe. And then over here to the right, you can choose the exact um, pieces that you did in there. And you can see here with the fringe, this is what actually drove this project was I think the last time you were on you showed a lot of different samples and stuff like that mm -hmm. of fringe so this is going to be a two-parter today we're going to do the mechanics of this and then I'm going to show the lariat that I've strung on Friday we're not going to talk about it that long because it's going to be pretty simple um but then you're going to delve into, you've got a lot of fringe samples that you're just going to have kind of an open discussion about as well. So this yeah. is going to be a two-parter. Yeah. So um, on that note, mm -hmm. uh, why don't we get to uh, your pieces? I'm going to add this in and I'm going to add mine in 
And let me see how I can arrange ourselves. Bear with me here just a take me second. Out. Take, a, take that demo camera oh, out. Take yeah, that out. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Let me, see let, let, me, uh, uh, let me do that. I've just kicked that out. But I'll show you over here while you're doing that. Um, I'll show you. Whoops, my camera is a little wonky. There we are. Um, so you can see. These are the two pieces that you made. And we've got, I'm going to highlight this here so people can see it. These are the two pieces that you've done. And I'm going to measure these for you guys so you can see them. Now, these are cool just on their own. There's a lot of ways that you can kind of adapt these to whatever you want them to do, right? This, though, the length of these, and they might be a little bit big for an earring. This from the tip to about where the fringe goes, it's about three and a half inches. It's pretty big. So you can see this other lantern earring that I'm putting right next to it. You can see it's about the same length, but this essentially, and I think you're going to talk about that, Em, is yeah. this piece right here that's on the left put together three times. So it forms a three-dimensional um kind of uh, a piece so if you're into making sets you know if you like you know a set of jewelry or a suite i like to call it um you could make the earring this way you could always make your fringe a little bit shorter or whatever you've also done them m where you've just done the lantern like this with you know sans fringe no fringe so um so this is really going to be a springboard for you uh, for you guys as you're designing. Now, when I saw these pieces, when Emily sent them over, I immediately thought lariat, right? And so I have, um, I have pulled some extra beads and stuff, and that's in the list. At the very, very end, uh, after you do your demo, I'm going to lay this out a little bit and give you guys an idea of how this lariat um, is going to go. So I'm going to solo, let me put that camera in. Let me, I'm going to mute that microphone. I think we're good. And then let me solo this one. Um, are we good here, Em? You can. Yep, I think so. Chat. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so uh, why don't you take it away? Sure. So, uh, Kate, you are absolutely right. This really started out as the flat lantern with no fringe. And mm -hmm. um, this was the very original lantern that we did. This is just one that didn't have the fringe completed on it. And I actually really liked, actually, let me back that thought up. Hold on one moment. Let me bring you yeah, in another I, this Yeah, was there the it is. That's the one. one. I, I just love these. I think that the negative shape that you've created, and it's really, I dig it a lot. I really, I really like it. I do too. And, and, and let me ask you something just real quick. Sorry, before we get any further. Right. Is there a way that you can adjust your lamp at all? We're a little dark. Okay. How about if I get out of the light a little bit? I think I was leaning into it. How are we now? Maybe. Yeah, it's a little better. Yeah. Everybody make sure that whatever device you're watching on, that you put that brightness all the way up. That might have been my issue, too. Now that my screen's a little bit brighter, I can see it a little bit better. Okay. How are we now? Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's better. Thank you so much. Sorry about it. So, you know, when we talk about evolution, it's it's kind of fun to see how things change from one finished piece to the next finished piece. You know, this added incorporation of um, two millimeter stone beads, um, which didn't make the final cut. Um, I think we ended up moving over to the three millimeter um, melons um, instead of I those think ones. On, we used them, you can see on, let me just put this right in just real quick, like you oh, can yeah, see can they're right on, yeah. on the bottom on the fringe okay. there. Yeah. Yeah. Really pretty. So, you know, we we did have this evolution as it kind of went along. One of the things that I, I really noticed when I was sort of looking at these and, and contemplating what was going to happen next was getting this into a 3D form. I really did need to have those 
um, cubes down the center to kind of give this some some um, stability and to give me some connection. Mm -hmm. The ones that you have in your hand, Kate, have no internal supports. So there's no stuffing in there to keep them stiff. That was an early talk that we had discussed that how were these gonna actually stay dimensional um, on their own? And they actually do. Right. I was thinking initially if with an earring that this might actually need a little bit of padding inside to kind of help keep it dimensional, but it mm -hmm. actually doesn't need that at all. So. Mm -hmm. And there was a quick question sure. uh, that Pam had. She was asking about these up at the top. These are the yep. three millimeter melons that we actually don't carry any longer, but oh, you good. used a three millimeter fire polish right here yep. at the top. This is yep. the three millimeter aqua Celsian. So Pam, those are, if you're doing this flat one, this is a great substitution for that. Yep. And the ones that I'm working with today, I actually dropped out the melon, I dropped out the three millimeter uh, fire polish and went in mm -hmm. with my true twos instead. Mm -hmm. And just made a little, I made a little editorial change. You know, after I had done mm -hmm. several of these, I kind of was like, I, I need to change. I need to do something different. Mm -hmm. So, so I brought you in can see, those, um, uh, yeah, true twos, which I do true -twos. like. And then, Lift it a little closer, M, if you sure. can see that. I want I want people to see see how you did those cubes also up at the mm -hmm. top. That's a little bit of a different mm -hmm. um, thing. So I'm so you guys take a look at that one, and now take a look at this one that I have here. So uh, you can really, you know, again make those small changes so that every time you make this you're not making the same one and so you can see the the three millimeter melons are here and then you have that small that smaller row of the of the cubes i'm going to go ahead and put that one you can see that emily had since the the two the true twos below were a little smaller it needed actually three melons above it instead of two yeah so one of the things i i i kind of came across as this was evolving with the mechanics of all this is that mm -hmm. you need a way to hook these sides together and we're going to mm -hmm. use these one these rows where the bead protrudes just a little bit further than it mm -hmm. might normally on a brick stitch earring let me turn myself around and just grab a brick stitch earring off the sample tray that i've got behind me because it's got i've got a kind of a classic brick stitch earring so mm -hmm. Classic brick stitching moves in that nice rhythmical pyramid right up to the top where the loop is. And none of them protrude further out. You could make them do that if you wanted to, but typically they don't protrude out. So that's where things get a little bit different with those different sizes of beads. The other thing that you might notice if you're very used to doing regular brick stitch is you'll notice that um, these rows do not change in quantity the way you might think they do. This is a, a row of seven, that base row across, and it's actually topped by a row of eight. So that's a, another difference. But I needed to fill in that space a little bit there, so I added an extra row of 11s. Above mm -hmm. that row of eight stacks becomes this row of size eight beads, and there's only six in this row. So things are a little different here. And this is something you can do to your own personal eye. But remember that having these little bit of a protruding bits here are gonna be really helpful when we go to connect all these guys together because it's gonna allow us to have those beads that will meet up together and be giving us a, a connection to join with. Um, I did do the same top and bottom here, above and below the base row. But if you want to change that up, you want to change the colors or the pattern or the beads, fine, knock yourself out. You can totally do that. Um, no one, no bead police is going to come to your house and tell you you can't do that. Um, I think we also changed, you know, from the original, mm, we changed in the cube size. We're not a four millimeter, but we're down to a three cube. Mm -hmm. so it's more petite in the center also, right? right? Yeah, that looks really nice. But these cubes are yeah. they give you lots of flexibility. They're super easy to work with too. They do have yeah. some variations. 
amongst them. They're not as regular and even as some of the size 11 beads. Um, so do try and match them up. If you have a really tall big one or a really short little one, you may want to put those aside to be in fringe or, or someplace else. Okay. So I made three all the same. And one thing I did with these um, was I left the threads existing. Mm -hmm. So my base row started here. Let me use my pointer, my fingers are too big. My base row started here and I ladder, laddered all the way across to get my base row and then went ahead and began my stitching and stitched both above and below the base row, okay? Mm -hmm. And when I got to the bottom of this second side, one side, two sides, when I got to that bottom side, that's when I decided this was gonna be the top end. And it really doesn't matter which end becomes the top or the bottom in this case, mm -hmm. um, but I did keep mine all the same. So I did repeat things exactly from one to the next. So there's one, Here's the second one. And you can tell this is my base row because the thread is short, what's left over. There's about right. eight inches or so. And here's my third one. And this one I think is the one that still has a needle attached, it does. So my needle is there, then, the last piece I made. And will you show us how to start that base row? Sure, you wanna see a ladder? That's easy. Yeah, let's okay. start. Let's start with that base row and then maybe you can assess it um, that which way you would go from the, to the top or the bottom. And the sure. rest, as you like to say, is just kind of a wash, rinse, repeat. And you guys can also watch that Tokyo Lantern or Shanghai Lantern uh, broadcast for like all the super details. But let's just throw that in there um, and you can talk a little bit about the thread you're using and stuff. Sure, I'm using KO. If you're cool with that. Um, which I have kind of begun to really dig. Um, I have used different threads over the years and had different phases of thread. Um, KO seems to be kind of a popular one for me right now. Um, I do love its colors. It comes in such a broad variety and it's a good volume of thread yeah. at a time. Mm -hmm. I do like to wax my thread. Here's my lumpy bumpy, not very attractive wax. Right, piece of beeswax, but you piece know. Piece you know, pull kind of my thread through it. I cut a piece of thread pretty much the same every time, about a yard and a half. And I'm using my thread singled, which means that although I double the thread to get through the needle, down at the working end, the end where the thread is going to be carrying the beads, it's a single thread. With brick okay. stitch, we're going to go through the beads at least a couple of times, if not more. So it's fine to have a single thread. Yeah, not uh, to be doubled. And real quick, yeah. before you start picking up those cubes, Teresa has a quick question. She says, do we need cubes for this base row? Or could no. you use something else for that? You can use sixes if you wanted. Um, sure. Cubes do sit together really nicely um, and they're kind of firm, which I appreciated in this one, um, that they weren't too wibbly wobbly. Um, I know that's a technical mm -hmm. term for Gita, especially, um, but mm -hmm. they, they sit up side beside one another very firmly and nicely. And so that was kind of a nice mm -hmm. effect. Um, certainly you could mm -hmm. use size six if you wanted in this case, and you could do taller stacks of these as well. Um, you know, we often talk about that base row of, of brick stitch being um, in stacks of three. You might use three beads as, in place as one bead. You could use a couple mm -hmm. beads there if you wanted to. Um, and I mm -hmm. certainly did that. What about, with the eighth. yeah, with some of those. What about A dot delicus? Sure. Again, yeah, that would work too. One of the things that comes up with delica beads and they are very squared off, so that's good. The eight aughts have a very, very large hole in comparison to the mm -hmm. wall stuff. And mm -hmm. you may find that, again, getting things to be kind of stable, the first few stitches you take a little bit, a tiny bit more of a struggle. Not not enormously more, but a tiny bit more um, of, of manipulating and holding things together while you're getting them to, to sort of stick together. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to pick up two beads. This is the start of a ladder stitch. And I'm going to slide those beads down 
near the end of the thread. And I'm gonna leave about eight inches this time because I'm gonna use that for joining all my, mm -hmm. uh, my walls, my sides of my lantern together. And with those two beads, I'm gonna go back through the first one. And I apologize, I did not use a stopper bead here. Um, if you need to use a stopper bead or want to use a stopper bead, do that and consider it not part of your project. It's just to keep the first couple beads on the thread. Um, I, I sometimes don't need a stopper bead to, to do this with. So this is my tail thread coming out at the bottom of this first bead. That's my second bead. This is my needle thread and my working thread coming out. To get to the point to add another bead, I'm gonna have to go back down through again that second bead. And now I'm gonna pick up a third bead. And I'm gonna loop around, going back down that second bead again. And back up that third bead to get my thread coming out next to the point where I'm gonna add the next bead. So I'm gonna pick up another bead and you're gonna see now this one is a little bit bigger than that third bead. The size of the beads, these cubes do vary. Not too worried about that little bit of a change. Actually bead number one and bead number three are pretty different, but I think we're gonna be okay here. So one of the things to remember about ladder stitching, and this is a common stitch that we, we might use in seed beading, is your thread always needs to be coming out right next to the spot where you're gonna add another bead. So mm -hmm. right now my thread is not at that point. It needs to go down this next bead again, and that'll get it to the point where it can come out and be ready to add another bead. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Good with that. Right. And can you get the camera just a little closer, Em? Would you put it down just a hair? I'm gonna lift my hand. Or raise up. your hands up. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Just a down. just a touch. Right. And then back through. So brick stitch um, base rows can be an odd or even number of beads. But that being said, making fringe is going to come out much more symmetrical if we have an odd number in our base row. So if you want to do fringe that's looped or pointed, it's really nice to have that odd number of beads to work with. If you don't care about doing fringe and you don't intend to do fringe, then having an even number is fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've got seven. I think that's what I did on all these. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Sometimes I even I forget what it's supposed to be. All <laughs> right. So I finished stitching my base row. And to solidify this base row, I'm going to serpentine or simply up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, all the way through my beads back to the beginning. And this step, not 100% necessary because our beads have already got two threads in each one. But the nice mm -hmm. part about this is that it really makes everything snug and firm and gets rid of that loosey goosey effect of things wobbling around. So this- And especially a, since this is a 3D or going to be a 3D. Yeah, we'd like it to be as sturdy and stiff as possible. Yeah. Yep. Right? So there's our base row, seven beads across. So I can bead up from this base row or down from this base row. And once I establish which way I'm going, that up and down kind of goes away. I'm just mm -hmm. having each side of this piece. So it doesn't matter if you start this direction or if you start this direction. You just go right to town. The next row is 11s. And I did them in stacks of three, which means that I pick up three beads where I would normally just pick up one bead. These three beads that I pick up become one bead. For all purposes now, that's three beads. 
That's, that is as if it was one. So I'm gonna pick up three beads twice. The very first stitch of each row in brick stitch is done with the first two beads. So the very first stitch of every row with brick stitch is done with two beads. I have two stacks of three, which are as two beads. I'm gonna look down yeah. at my stacks now, and you can see the thread bridge that loops between each pair of beads, okay? Every set of beads has got a thread bridge. So I'm gonna go and count to the second thread bridge. There's one thread bridge, and there's the second. I'm gonna stick my needle under, and I tend to work from back to front. So away from me and towards me, back to front. I'm gonna pull that through so that my beads sit kind of bridging those two um, stacks. And I'm gonna go back up the second bead, which is the second bead I put on the thread. Pull my thread through. And it's under that thread loop, and you'll see that the beads will start to sit up top on top of the, of the stack of the base row. I'm gonna go back down the first bead, catch the thread loop between the first and second, pull my thread through, and go back up that second group, okay? So brick stitch is very repetitive in this way, but it has that first little stitch at the beginning of each row that you have to be paying attention to a little bit. From here on out, I'm gonna catch every thread loop as I go across. Now, because I'm not doing this in the traditional sense of brick stitch, I might actually have more than one stack of beads on this thread loop, okay? And I'm doing that so that I can get eight stacks across, all right? I want eight because it fills up that gap but still leaves me a little bit of room, as you can see here, still leaves me a little bit of room to have those, those cubes stick out a bit farther than we normally would. If I only had, if this is only seven across and I only had six in there, I would really have a lot of space. I don't need quite that much, I need just a little. Okay, so I'm gonna pick up three more beads. Remember, even though I'm picking up three, these are acting as one. I'm gonna catch that same second thread loop. And if you were to change this up some, just remember that you don't want to quite use up all the space that you've got on that base row. You want a little bit of it sticking out. You want that next row to be a little bit smaller. Go ahead and lift your hands a little bit and you're almost off the, the, the there you go. A little further to the center, I think. You're yeah. kind of drifting to the edge. That's because I'm looking at my fingertips from here and saying I can't right. really see what I'm doing. But right, I'm exactly. trust, I I'm feel trust you. that I'm there. That's right. Right? Back up that stack. So brick stitch, the base row, even though it's a different stitch, they're sort of similar. You have to get your needle and thread coming out the spot right next to the place where you're going to pick up the next set of beads, right? And let's see, um, can we see that thread bridge? Can you lift your hands up pretty close to the camera and just leave your needle under that thread bridge so we can see that there? Yeah, so you guys, you can really see where Emily has positioned that needle. It's that little bridge of thread that's going from one cube to the next. Perfect. I can turn it around here and you can see them on the bottom too. All right. Oh, sorry. So I did make an error here. This is a good error. This is a good kind of a mistake to make in front of everybody, right? I picked up four beads instead of three. And this is the place where I definitely don't want that fourth bead. Now you can do a couple of different things. Um, you can use your awl inside the bead and force the bead down on the awl to break it. Right now, this bead does not allow my awl to go through very far, so it's a little less of a, um, 
have a, a good spot for that. But if I use my round nose pliers, I can pinch the bead and break it pretty easily. So what I've done is I've pulled the thread to one side of the bead, okay? So I'm holding the bead so that the thread is only under my fingertips and the rest of the bead is kind of sitting out away. And I'm gonna take my round nose pliers, these are my big rosary pliers, and I'm gonna pinch the bead from top to bottom. So I'm not pinching around the, dia the diameter of the bead, I'm grabbing it from hole to hole. Does that make sense? Right, and that thread is, and your thread is out of the way. My thread because is you way don't here out of the way. You see? want that broken bead to um, break your thread. So I covered it with my fingers, and I broke the bead. So that's gone. So it's not, it's not a, you know, end of the day. I could also have unthreaded my needle, pulled that all off, and pulled out one bead. But it's a little faster to just break the bead out. That's the wrong bead. Not not wrong, just in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's Sorry. right. All right. So it's interesting, you'll note when you start working with matte seed beads, they're a little bit, another technical term for Gita here, they're a little bit scritchy. They rub up against each other and they, you can kind of feel the texture happening. Um, but I also find that matte seed beads have, they hold the thread a little bit. They kind of grip it nicely and give you, a, it's a little bit of an advantage actually to have a thread and a bead that's not quite so slippery. Alrighty, so we're almost to the end of the row. I'm gonna do one more in the last, wow, look at that, I picked up exactly the right number of beads. That's never happens. That's satisfying. Isn't it? Okay. Now, if I was doing traditional brick stitch, each row would be getting shorter by one. That would give us that pyramid or diamonding kind of shape. In this case, I have two rows of four, two stacks of four. So there's that next row. Okay. And then we're on to eights. So we're done with cubes. We're done with 11s for the moment. We're on to the eights. And this time, I'm going to use four beads in place of two beads, right? So these two stacks of two are four beads masquerading as two beads. I'm going to go to the second thread bridge. So here's the first one. There's the second one. And I'm going to go back in underneath that thread bridge from back to front. Pull it through. And I'm going to go up the second stack. So that's the second one that I had on the thread and needle. Down the first, catching the thread loop between the first and second ones from the previous row. And back up the second. So I'm ready to go. Nice. Right. And I'm going to just tootle myself right along here, filling in the gap of a row, doing the same under the thread loop up back up the stack of beads. So each, each uh, bead in here has at least two threads through it. So if you're worried about thread being too thin and working single, you don't really need to worry about that. Put your mind at rest. One thing you don't need to worry about, not many things like that these days. Yeah, it looks, and I like the, I like the contrast M of all of these colors here. I think me they too. look pretty, pretty cool. You know what it reminds me of? 
What's that? It reminds me of hydrangeas. Mm, it is very hydrangea-like. Yeah. One of my favorite flowers, for sure. One of uh, uh, Janice's as well. Hortensia is another name for hydrangea. Oh, where you got the name. And the I title. know someone named Hortensia, which I always thought her name was so pretty. And I had no idea that that's what it was until I did a little huh. research. I didn't know it was one of JP's favorites, too. Yeah. I always think that they're really, they're kind of funny. Look, they're a little bit Susian um, as a plant. You know, they look a little yeah. odd. They don't look quite, um, they don't look like they're quite but from nature. They look like they're yeah. imagined. Now, I, I love them. They have a very old-fashioned flair to me. Yep. Um, when I was little, I had a, a, a book an old version of rebecca of sunnybrook farm which is one of mm. my favorite books in the whole wide world and when rebecca arrives at the aunt's house she arrives with as she says her dress uh back hind foremost which is you know the front is the back mm -hmm. um because she has to button herself up and she arrives with a large um bouquet of uh, hydrangeas and so the the illustration on that version was Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm arriving with her hydrangeas so <laughs> I always have kind of an old-fashioned uh, feeling for those flowers I still carry that that picture in my head well this is one of these the color palettes that I I might not have chosen on my own you and I kind of picked this together but I I might not have chosen this on my own, but I really love it now that it's. Oh, here. I'm glad you liked. I'm glad you, you liked know? it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm on to moving on to bugles. Oh, bugles. Oh, bugles. And bugles, you just do exactly the same way, right? And now you're going to get this height out of them, which is really fun. Or as Jessica would say, height. Height. <laughs> Little shout out to our buddy Jess Gaston. I um, I tell that story sort of regularly, actually, <laughs> about where that it came from. You know how you have inside jokes with your friends, and um, because you have a shared experience of some sort, that it takes just that one word to make you dissolve into laughter. And um, I miss that. I miss being with my friends and yeah. laughing about the silliest of things. Um, because but, boy, do we have a lot of them. But on the other hand, all I have to do is think about height and I'm right back there. <laughs> right back on the road. Right you back and me and Jess. Show, I think is where That's we right. Were. That's right? right. So should we tell yeah. them the story about the heights? <laughs> I don't know who this was who was in the line at the um at the cafeteria. But <laughs> There was a salad bar and there was a hand, you know, when you're, if you've ever been to a trade show, they're very long on overpriced food. It's sort of like the airport, you know, yeah. overpriced but not very good food. And yeah. yet everyone is kind of exhausted and strung out and they have to eat. And so you you're, you really have no choice but to eat um, some food at the, at the location. And this salad bar had the sign on it that said, <laughs> Dressing is included in the weight. <laughs> this was a salad yes. bar that they would weigh your salad. And I guess people were taking the dressing and not paying for it in the weight of their salad because they're having it on the side. A dressing must be included in the weight with a TH at the end instead of a. That's TH. right. <laughs> so, so that became height and weight. Height and weight. That's and right. What's it's. It's going to live on in our, on forever. In our, yes, in our vernacular forever. Because forever. when you're building your trade show booth, you're not only working and, and get back. Yeah. Right in the center. Yeah. There you go. Sorry. Um, when you're building your trade show booth, not only are you doing the layout of a table, but you also want height, right? Uh, when you're, when you're creating your display, because one of the, the, 
trade show 101 of setting up is you don't want your customers bending over your table, right? So you get that height by adding bed risers. You get bed risers and you put bed risers under the legs of the table. And so your table is not, you know, at waist height, height, but uh, it's a little bit taller, right? And then you uh, kind of step back and you add more height by like displays and boxes and stuff underneath. So, uh, so when we were looking, stepping back and looking critically at our trade show table, Jessica uh, just kind of tossed it out there and said, you guys, we need more height. <laughs> and so that is uh, our height and weight story. Yeah. But always remember when you're building your trade show booth, you want more height. It, it, I got to tell you, when I hear you say the word, it makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah, it's just because you're so tired. You're, you're setting up that trade show booth and all you're thinking about is, you know, having dinner in a booth, right? <laughs> after, after setup, that's all you're thinking of. Yeah. But um, trade shows are not for the faint of heart, but boy, are they fun. Anyway, so Em, it looks like you have kind of added your, um, the, the taper there. So yep. you guys can tell. Now, the, the taper that you have there, is mm -hmm. this the point where you would reverse course or when do you decide to kind of do the taper at the bottom? You know, you can, you can choose. It's entirely up to you. I did in this, in this particular instance, actually do exactly that. I stopped mm -hmm. and looped myself, worked my way back up to the beginning and went, went and did the other side. So mm -hmm. really what you're seeing is this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, and that, this is all very easy to do. It's still one piece of thread. If your thread gets mm -hmm. tired and weary, and that does happen sometimes to thread, feel free to change it. It's okay to do that. Um, I find that I can get through this pretty comfortably with one piece of thread. And and I, mm -hmm. I know I've said this before in seed bead school. Mm -hmm. When I stitch through a bead, I use the needle only to pull myself through to get my thread to come through. And then I pull the thread itself through. If mm -hmm. you find yourself constantly pulling this way, you know, pulling your thread with the needle, you're gonna wear it's that. Gonna bottle fatigue. So yeah. pull through and then grab it with your finger and pull that through. So you're not agitating quite so much on the eye of the needle. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can remember to do that, and I do find that that also rests my fingertip thumb grip a little bit in between mm -hmm. each stitch, which as ergonomics go, that's important. So mm -hmm. I'm done with the taper. Right. And, and so you would just uh, do the top part, right? Right. Right. So now I'm going to take my needle. I'm going to go back down um, a bugle, back down some eights. And I'm going to hop over here to this stack of 11s and wiggle myself right out that cube. Mm -hmm. So now I'm ready to go again. It's kind of nice about work stitch is it, it just kind of has a lot of flexibility in this fashion. And I would yeah. just continue to build up to that next end and then repeat that times three. Right. So then we can, uh, jump forward to now you've created all three of these sides. Yeah, the fun part. Well, you know, it's funny, I, I have long said that fringe is sort of the dessert, you know, it's the fun part at the end of your mm -hmm. piece. You know, if you want to really make a loud noise with your fringe, you can really add a lot here. And certainly this is just a good, this is a good classic um, example of, of doing fringe like that. This has the classic pointed shape at the bottom and it's emulating the diamond or pyramid shape at the top. In this case, it's single, single rows of Delica beads. And that's my mm -hmm. base row is this one purple row in there that's just one row of Delica. So the thing I did with the cubes to begin with, I was doing that with single Delica beads. So the cubes are like giant beads in comparison. 
Um, mm -hmm. And you could do these with size 15 seed beads, which are even tinier. Mm -hmm. There's lots of detail. So in this case, I, I used the uh, purple beads to help kind of set the diagonal here and this diamond shape to give me that very dramatic drop. I used fire polish to help push those fringes apart and give me a fanned out shape instead of a very straight up and down shape. And this mm -hmm. is a classic brick stitch earring uh, shape that you might encounter. Again, having that odd number means in the base row means that I have a long middle fringe and it's easy to figure where that's going to be. Okay. And now I have three, I'm just gonna clear the decks here a little bit. I have three all alike, okay? And I'm going to use the tail threads to actually join these together. So each one of these has a tail thread coming out of it. And I'm gonna use a different tail thread to join each one together. I have a little bit of reasoning behind this. I think it's wise with seed beading to occasionally change threads or make a thread finish and start again. The advantage to that is that if your thread happens to fail, if it happens to break, that it would only unravel to a certain point and then you'd be able to fix it and repair it. Um, in the interest of expediency, I liked this to have only to use one piece of thread. Um, it just means it. I don't have to stop and start and bury it and start a new thread, but it's, it's easy to begin and end a thread. I begin and end my threads in a very particular fashion. If I need to end a thread, and begin a new one. I actually start by threading up a new needle and thread. And I start by burying and securing the first, the new thread before I deal with the old thread. Mm, so um, you know where you need to end up, right? Absolutely. I will bury my new thread so that when I bring the needle out, it comes out at the point where the old thread is coming out. And then I will bury that old thread and get rid of it. So I have my new and my old in there at the same moment. So for a couple of stitches, you'll have two threads at the same place and it will feel a little confusing, but fairly quickly you're gonna get rid of one thread and then the other one is ready to go. Rather than trying to have to remember where you ended, mm -hmm. get that new thread started first and then deal with the old thread, okay? With peyote stitch, sense. I might stitch on a little ways and then deal with the old thread. With, with looming, I would leave my old thread dangling, get my new thread going, make a few rows of loom, and then end up and get rid of that old thread. So to me, that makes the most sense. And, th and this is just my years of doing a lot of stitching. Right. Right. So I'm going to thread my needle back onto the tail end of one of these pieces, and it doesn't matter which one you have. And I'm gonna bring the two of them together. Now I know this feels very familiar, right? Doesn't this look like what we just did? Mm-hmm. So we're just bringing them together. So you're and kind of brick stitching. Yep, the, the ladder the stitching end. them together. Mm -hmm. And I am doing it fairly firmly. So this is one of those things, this is gonna end up being good for us. I want them to be firmly attached to one another. If they're firmly attached, it's gonna give me that dimension that I want, mm -hmm. right? It's gonna allow me to have that stiffness to my piece. Mm -hmm. so and so I'm gonna actually put this up on here. Uh, so there's a question here that says, so you don't do a hitch knot with the old and new thread. You don't tie a knot at all. You just weave it in and then weave it out. And that weaving is what holds it together. Is that correct? That's correct. Typically when mm -hmm. I'm doing seed bead stitching, I don't tie knots. The reason mm -hmm. is if I tie a knot, it's probably going to show. It's going to push the beads mm -hmm. apart where the thread might be and it's going to show. It also, if it doesn't show, it may clog up a hole in a bead that I need to go through again. 
So mm -hmm. I avoid tying knots as much as possible. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, in most looming that I do, even though you may tie a knot to secure your thread to your warps, your weaving thread to your warps is the very first step, I usually untie that thread mm -hmm. and then weave it in. So almost no knots. There are exceptions to this policy. <laughs> the exceptions are right angle weave, I will tie a knot. I will also tie a knot in um, adding thread with spiral rope um, mm -hmm. or with beaded berry chain. Those are places where I don't have enough density to weave in and have it be secure. Um, so there are exceptions to the rule, but there are more times where I weave without a knot, which I think is kind of cool. You know, there's no knots in your piece. Knotting can also change the tension in that row or that area. And then you have something that looks a little stiff or it looks a little pulled to the side or it's not quite the same as the others. So no knots for me. So I've woven through um, a few times between those two cubes. Now I'm going to take my needle and I'm going to go up through those three elevens and through the two eights in the next row. I hope you can see where I'm going with this. I'm going to jump over to that other eight. And this is a place where you want to be mindful of your thread. Don't get mm -hmm. a thread loop hanging out somewhere. So this is where I started to go, yeah, this is going to lantern up really good because it's already starting to have kind of a 3D shape, right? Yeah. Now, there is a question that you can address now that Kim has. Can you use cube seven as cube one for the next size? so it fits or do you, you know what? i don't think it will make a difference kim if you use mm -hmm. cube one for cube seven in other words you were to ladder yourself a long row of cubes and then build your pieces up from there the problem is, is that it won't it may not bend into shape so mm -hmm. let me go back to the one that i was working on over here Right. And that was the question here, I think. Um, but I why is there not a long really center? Susan had this question sure. as to why you didn't do that long, like triangle center and right. then build the sides up from there. So what you're saying is, is that if you do it in threes and then join it, it'll be more um, triangular. Right. You could. I mean, I just bent the one that I made earlier. Mm -hmm. So you could do it like that if you wanted. Um, from past experiences, I think for me, it'd be easier to build it in pieces and then assemble them mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than trying to manipulate one big one. Mm -hmm. um, so I I took the, the parts way out, right? But you could do it like this. Mm hmm Tension might be an issue too, maybe. Mm, I don't know. I just think I it's know. easier to build maybe it not. apart. Mm hmm That was my approach. Mm hmm Okay. So here we are. We've got two joins. And we're going to do about three joins as we go up this side here. I mean, yeah, I am dealing with a few threads here, but I don't know. That's not such a big deal to me. Mm -hmm. um, You're never afraid of weaving in and out. No. Why should I be? No. Nope. I'm going to go up to that next cube and do the same thing. Ooh, Kate, I'm having a hot flash. I'm going to have to open a window here in a second. All right. <laughs> That's okay. I think I have a, this uh, is all looking the good, that though. turned on. Hmm? It's, come, it's coming together nicely. Yeah, so yeah. I think um, as you're doing that stitching, I am going to, if it's a good spot to do it, sure. I'm going to move the camera over to what I've got going on here. And I right. want to talk a little bit about the lariat connection. Sounds and good. And then... Um, when are we going to tackle the fringe? Are we going to tackle the fringe today or do you want to tackle the fringe on Friday? 
I actually, I had planned to tackle fringe today. Okay, and, great. Um, it just means I've got to finish this one row and go stitch the okay. other side in. And that's okay. not going to take too long. I want to okay. talk about closing up the top a little okay. bit. And then um, this is, I'm, I'm a couple minutes from being ready to talk fringe. I'm about five okay. minutes from being ready to talk fringe. Okay. So why don't I right. take this part sure. to uh, chat a time. little bit um, and then you let me know when you're ready. But All I'll right. chat a little bit about um, my thoughts about the lariat here, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll move forward. Right. Okay. So I'm going to lay out this. So let's take a look at what I've got here on my board. So I, I'll i be honest, you guys, I'd been kind of putting this off. I had pulled the color palette. When I pulled the color palette um, for Emily, I kind of had an idea about, you know, I, I was thinking right away that a lariat would be a cool thing because again, it has kind of that vintage vibe. I feel like these lanterns kind of have that vintage vibe. So um, I didn't think about it too much and thought, you know what, I'm just gonna put, um, I'm just gonna make these ends into a lariat. Though you could make this as a centerpiece, right? And then uh, kind of, you know, start it here like this and just do two strands out like this. So um, Emily is using KO for the body of the pieces that she's doing. And then I switched it up to the 0 0.014 soft flex that I've got here. Okay. So let me talk to you a little bit of what about what I've got. Let me get a little tighter down here, a little closer so you guys can see this. So when Emily sent these to me, they were sans loop, no loop up here at the top. And so I thought a lot about a lot of different ways how I would connect these, right? Would I wire wrap? Would I send an eye pin up through or a head pin up through here? wire wrap it, wire wrap it to a loop and connect it there. But sometimes the most simplest solutions I think are the most elegant. So, and I didn't want too much of a differentiation between what I had going on here. So what I did was I took the ends of my soft flex and I cut two lengths of soft flex that were about, these are about 50 inches each right and i've got two strands right here okay so i went in and i grabbed the 11 knots and i used the the purple here that um emily used at the top this duracoat um silver line dyed dark lilac that's what this is and whoops i'm getting a little bit of feedback there um i didn't do anything <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to mute you. I muted you out for just a second there. Um, so I came in and I strung both of those ends like this right here. And then I came through, I sent them through a single crimp tube. I crimped it and then I put a crimp cover over the top. Okay, and so you can see I've got a double strand of soft flex running up from that crimp tube that's under this crimp cover. And then I just strung these guys, the, the Emily used these five millimeter rondelles, that periwinkle grape. And then I added this eight millimeter English cut because again, English cut to me says, um, says vintage bead for sure. Um, and Em, I'm just going to let you know your demo camera bowed out, so you may want to add it back. Um, it's dark here. So I'm going to unmute you. There we go. I see it now. Um, and so uh, I added the drops, and then I did a little trick that Janice likes to do, which is mirroring. Okay, so here's this connection here. This in the middle, I used some of the cubes. I just strung what I thought looked nice, and then I mirrored it and flipped it so it had some nice negative space, so it's here, okay? Then I added um, um, a little bit more here, and I'll lift the camera up so you can see it a little bit more. I thought that the lariat would maybe would have some slimmer portions 
to it. And I wanted to use the um, the Tyla or the uh, yeah the Tyla the Tyla bead here. And you can see that is a two hold bead. Looks like this, right? And then it uh, I used some of those bugles. So I strung two strands, brought it together under the Tyla, two strands under the Tyla, et cetera. And I'm just kind of meandering my way to the back of the piece, OK? Then the back of the piece, and I want to make sure I want to see where I'm going to spend these drops, right? They come in strands of six. So I know that I have to put these aside for the opposite end of this, but I have two, um, that'll go over there, but I still have two drops. So I think the center back, I'm going to do maybe this repeat, maybe do a couple of English cuts there, right? And then maybe do like two here and two here. So it drapes around the back of the neck a little nicer. And then I'll do this section here. And then I'll do this section here and um, end with this guy, with this guy over here. Okay. So, um, so it kind of has three points to it. This one, the opposite one that's going to be over this tassel, and then this one here in the back. And so I am about, if I measure this out, and I know my tassel is here, I am about close to halfway here. So I'm going to keep going and measure till I get to the center portion of where I go. And then I'm going to add this section on. So Em, you let me know when you're ready. OK, I'm almost there. OK, yep, no problem. And so what I do when I string something like this, and you can see I'm on this section here. I've got one more of these to go. And let me get a little bit closer here. Um, what I'll do is, and you can see I've got a big old mess here on my board, but that's kind of how I roll. I'll come in and I'll string. So I need two. Oh, and see, look, I noticed that one is so that one I have to also break. I strung three instead of two. So let me see if I can pop that one if it wants to pop. That one doesn't, I'm just going to undo it. I don't want to damage my self flex at all. Emily's a better seed bead breaker than I am. So I have to be real. well, I have to be really aware of my count of these beads because it's easy to get them off. So that's why I kind of string it this way. And I'll show you, I need a green one and then two purples. And then I'll go through the tila. So I'll string one side and then I'll string exactly the same thing on the other strand. So if I'm here, I have to repeat that. So I'll get my, um, my, um, these guys here. And I'll just hold both of these strands in my fingers and I'll go one, two, one green, one, two, and that's it for that side. And then I'll go one, two, one of the olive green and one, two. Then I'll take both of those in my fingers like this and I'll get my bead, my two hold bead. And I want to make sure that my thread isn't twisted. So I'll pull it all the way down to make sure that I'm consistent with the sides. Like if I strung this side of the strand into that hole and that side of the strand into this hole, the thread would be twisted. So I want to make sure that's straight. So there's my intentional three repeat. I think I need to do one more section. Let me see. One, two, three. One, two, and three. So I need to do that one again. So just follow your, you know, and it doesn't have to be exactly Right. I mean, I'm trying to do a pattern, but, um, you know, we'll 
<laughs> we'll see how it goes. This piece has so many beads in it that if your pattern is a little off in one of them, it's really never going to be seen. I'll just go through that pile, put those on. And I try and keep in my mind, I know that this is the strand that's on that side, that's the strand that's on that side. And so I'll slide these down. Now we're ready. Now we are ready for, actually, I didn't need that one. I think that one might have been a little off. It doesn't really matter. I'll take these guys off and I'll put, um, I'll put the bugles on. So again, holding them both strands in one hand, putting the bugle on one, putting the bugle on the other, and then just going back and forth with what you need to string on. So three of these on this one, and then three of those on the other. That one is no good, so I'm going to cast it aside. Hmm. But this way, it kind of keeps you doing one on one strand and one on the other. Sorry about that, Em. You all set to go? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, so I'm going to solo your demo right here. And oh. you know what? You're kind of, you're on the side. Oh, hang on. You're on the side. So I'm going to remove you and remove you and let you turn it. Let me see if I can get it to come back like this. Oh. That's okay. And I will do this and uh, just keep going. And you can get kind of in a rhythm for this so that you'll make fewer gaffes. At least that's what I'm telling myself. Um, the bugles are nice because they have a, some length to them. So they, um, they help move this process along a little bit faster. Okay, and, I'm just gonna uh, plug in my phone to charge the battery a little bit. And so you may get a okay. moment of feedback here, but hopefully it'll be quick. Sure. Yep, no worries. I'm gonna unmute you then for just a second. There you go. Um, and I'll check back in with you in a moment. So let's slide these down. And so you can see doing those kind of two by two, everything just starts to slide in together like this, right? And you can add, like if I feel, I've got a lot of these English cuts here. So maybe if I don't want this to be so skinny or so slim, I can come in and taper. So I will taper this down, those two beads, one and two, and maybe I'll taper them down three. So there's a good taper and one, two, and three. And I mean, since I have them, I might as well use them. Um, I'll throw in that daisy spacer. And this saw flex does double through the hole. Um, so uh, there's no problem there. And, and just an FYI, I don't see your demo cam on the thing, but I think you know that. So I'm just going to keep stringing this until you tell me you're ready. So that will go on. Um, this piece will here will be here. And I think there was a question, Donna. I think I missed it. So, um, but the two millimeter crimp tubes, that's right. I use a three millimeter um, crimp cover. So um, your crimp cover is always just slightly larger than your crimp tube. So as I'm going, you can see if I if I bring these together, I'm not going to um, push them together too tightly because I don't want this, see if when I crimp it and I push this down, I don't want this to be too stiff here like this, right? So I'll just kind of shake it out a little bit and it will just kind of taper here at the end. And so once I've made one of these sections, I can go back to uh, what's happening here or just use your, um, you know, use your beads however, however you might want to do them. I'm going to measure this. Let me raise the camera a little bit 
so we can measure this and see where we are with it. Um, as I said, I had about 50 inches and I'm going to double this over. Um, so I'm about maybe a quarter of the way here. I'm going to string, what's this length? I'll tell you. Here to here, this is about seven inches. So I'm going to string about another seven inches here. And then I'll check. Then I'll string what's on the back. And then I'm home free. I'll just mirror what's happening on this side to what's happening over here. Let's check in. Oh, and I think I've got you on a little bit of a feedback there so let's make sure that your demo cam is um muted and you have something plugged in to the headphone jack for that so we don't get that feedback loop so i'm going to go ahead and add and you know i'm i'm looking at this here and and let's take a look at this let me Pull this down a little bit, okay? And so you can see here with my seed beads how this is displacing this just a little bit over this um, over this daisy spacer, which I'm not totally in love with. So I'm going to take that out, and I'm going to see if it makes any difference if I instead of putting the daisy spacer next to those beads and I'm also going to add one more seed bead so maybe the taper will be a little more gradual and I'm going to put on my five millimeter um, rondelle like this and then I'll put on that daisy then I'll put on Whoops, one date. Let's get it through both. And I like to kind of have my soft flex together, right? Like this here. Um, so it's easy to pick things up. I'm going to actually put in, because I've got plenty of these English cuts, so I might as well use them. Um, so it's not super skinny all the way around. Um, I'm going to put three. I'm going to do a triple repeat here one two and three and the pattern as you're working you know i like to kind of as i always say i like to cast my mind forward into the design to see um you know to kind of think about the next step as i'm working on this step so that's kind of what I'm doing here. And I realized when I was looking at just that single English cut down there, um, I wanted to have something that, um, it felt a little skinny to me is what I'm trying to say. So I wanted something a little more substantial in this portion because we're about a quarter of the way up. Plus, it'll take a little more, yeah, and see how that, I think, visually is a little more pleasing to the eye, right? I think that looks good. And I'm going to unmute you. How are we doing over there? Looks looks good, I think. I think we're back in business. Uh, sorry, okay. I had a little tiny te technical difficulty, but I That's just right. put my That's... Richburg hat on and said, I got this, and um, yeah. Yeah, you I do. got that. <laughs> yeah yeah you do well yeah. great well it's good timing because um and my mom is saying i've got four seed beads by the shadow i can't i've got four here on both of these so um but i think it's it's just taking it out of alignment I'm, just it on the big screen. <laughs> I'm not worried about it too much what's that em your mom's watching it on the big screen. I know. Yeah, she is. She can see it. Exactly. So I'm going to add you to the stream here. And then I am going to, uh, you're spotlighted there. So take it away, M. And let's get it maybe a little closer to the center of the screen if you can. And make sure that it's kind of close up. There we go. Perfect. Thank you ever so. Looks perf. Right. So all three sides joined together. And I have dimension. 
I did use my pinky finger to go inside there and kind of push everything a little, or out a little bit, but now it's standing alone, right? Mm -hmm. It looks good. Mentioned. Great. So I have my three finishing threads coming out of the top. Um, and really what I did here was I added one more bead to join all three of them together and kind of cinch it in at the top, one more seed bead. But I'm first I'm gonna take two of these threads and move them to the bottom. And okay. on, the, on their way to the bottom, um, they're gonna actually pull together the bottom edges of this piece as well. So I did the top side, but I wanna do one more join right down here to bring these guys together. So very simply, and this is with what I would normally do with brick stitch, is I'm just gonna use my beads to traverse down to the bottom, to where I need to be. I'm just working my way through the beads and it's okay to pass through them again because they're Japanese beads. We have lots of room in there. And mm -hmm. we're just- And again, and can we get a little more centered, center frame? Sorry, you're, you're drifting. Yes, you know why that's happening. I, I, I do because it's hard. It's hard to see. those beads are small. That's why. <laughs> oh, if those beads are too small, we're too old. So no, they're not. They're fine. That's right. Right. And just gonna cinch it in. So it's gonna pull together. I think what throws me is that I think I'm in the middle of the camera, but the lens is in a different place. Right. It right. gives me the. Right. For me to orient to. Right. Right. And now I'm going to come out on the bottom edge with this thread and I'm going to let it hang because it's going to be a fringe. And I'm going to do the same thing with the uh, with one more thread. It doesn't really matter which one of these threads you use. Right. You've got plenty of thread to work with. If you need more, you can add more. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to use this one to do that same job. So all I did was come, whatever bead I'm coming out of, I go through the one next door. And mm -hmm. I angle myself through the beadwork. It might take you a row or two to get to that edge feel. Oops. And then I'm gonna just travel my way down through those beads. Kind of getting down to that base row here. So you're kind of repeating, you repeat that then on all three of the sides. Well, first I'm going to do it on two sides and I'm going to use the third thread to cinch the top together. Oh, I see. Okay. Then I'll bring it down as well. Mm hmm Okay. Gotcha. So this is a fairly fast little step. It doesn't take very long. You know, it's funny mm -hmm. as, as long as these, well, I now gauge everything by how many episodes of whatever series I'm watching on the internet through the pandemic. What have we been doing? We're watching things by the series, right? Right. And go ahead, Em, and center your out of frame again. Sorry. There you go. And so how many series of what did this take? How many you? episodes of the series that I'm watching? Yeah. Um, I did two in one episode. <laughs> And then I had to go to the second episode to do the third piece yesterday or not yesterday, a few days ago um, to get these guys done. So it was, it didn't take very long. Um, and, you know, once you've done one, it's just lather, rinse, repeat. It's really mm -hmm. not, you know, a big difference. So now here we are at the top with my last thread. I'm going to pick up a bead. I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna go across to the next panel, my next side, come back up. And all this is gonna do is reduce it down to one bead instead of two at the top. And mm. that one bead, Kate, if you'll show them yours too, you'll be able to see at the top of each one that it ends yeah, on let me one get this. Bead. And that gives you something to pass through in a little circle and kind of cinch everything down together. That little, you can see the little three, that little flat Pico there. I came in with my soft flex on one side, 
went under those three and then back up the other side. So that's how I, I connected those. And I came up and I crimped there, okay, to add, um, to add it on. So you're back on the, so you're weaving your way down. So what yep. you've done is you've added that flat pico at the top and taken that same thread and now you're weaving it down to create the fringe. And so what I think we'll do, M, since mm. we're about at noon, um, we're going to do a fringe episode on Friday and we're going to look at all of your different fringes. So I think we'll stop right here if that's okay with you. Sure. And then we'll pick this up on Friday um, and we'll add the fringe to this one. And we'll talk about the two different types of fringes um, that you created. And then uh, for we'll do that for about half the episode. Then the other half of the episode, and again, you're drifting down a little, a little bit. So there we go. Um, uh, and then the other half of the episode, we'll look at a bunch of your fringe uh, projects um so you can uh see some different ways of how to of how to put those together so now you're coming in with your final connection through those um through those bugles the sixes actually the bugles i'll leave oh, the sixes. Yeah, oh okay you leave the bugles open on this one okay okay gotcha gotcha And so that's it. Great. It would make a nice topper or lid for something too, right? You know, we could do it as a tassel. Yeah. It could be a cool tassel topper for sure. Mm -hmm. But when you, now that people are looking and kind of tilt it, M, so everybody can see those, those, um, yeah, the bugles at the bottom. I want to show you guys, um, I'm actually going to put this one up here too. So see how Emily, she stitched these together and then these guys all come in and you can see that each of those, I'm going to open it up here, each of those bugle beads has that fringe coming out of it, right? So if you turn it around and it's all clustered together, it looks like, oh, it looks all multi-layered and stuff. But if you open it up here, you can see that each of the bugles, that's where this fringe originates. There's nothing down the center of it, okay? So I'm gonna put yours back on here, Em. You know, and I, I, I really had kind of made a conscious choice not to connect these bugles this time. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see how much more flare we got from this fringe. So it's a little bit of mm -hmm. an experiment compared to the ones we did before. I do like the, the tightness of the ones you have in your hands and mm -hmm. the stability of them, but I want to see if I can get a little bit more play out of the fringe with these not mm -hmm. attached bugles. I think I want so a this more. one. Yeah. So this one that I'm holding here, you mm -hmm. also attach the bugles together. Yep. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now on the fringe, here's a here's a question, mm -hmm. and we can talk about it more. Uh, but it's kind of something to. Now that we've gotten there, we can take a look. Right. Margaret's asking: Are each of these fringes the same length? And they're not. Mm -hmm. You have some that are shorter and then you've got some that fall below that have the drops. Yep. And then on the second one, the fringe is completely different. You've got some long drops here and then you've created some looped fringe. So we're going to talk about that um, on Friday. Oops, let You're me right, do that. Kate. Okay. So this looks good. So do you feel like this is a good stopping point, M? Sure, sure, it sounds great. Okay, well, fantastic. I'm going to pull this out here and pull this out here and put us 
up. There we are. Look at us. Hey, Kate. All right. Uh, Michelle was also asking, and this is something that you've done with herringbone, Emily. You mm -hmm. could put a wooden bead in the center for more structure. Would that be something sure. that maybe you could do? Yeah, if you wanted. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessary. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking initially that I was going to need to put some stuffing, like some fiber fill in there. Mm -hmm. uh, or fiber fill with a little bit of fabric wrapped around it to give it some color. Uh, mm -hmm. put in there. One of the things that's kind of intriguing me right now is, and I know you can't show this, but I'll hold it up my end. One of the things that's- Oh, I can show you. Me, I can put no, it back. Okay. This is okay. fine. Okay. What's intriguing me right now is this opening here. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of liking that little windows, little windows. Mm -hmm. I don't know what would happen with them yet, but I'm I'm sort of thinking that now instead of having three pieces, I need to have six so that those windows are bigger. There's more of them. Right. So and six then, panels, you mean? Yeah. Then I'm going to spotlight those, this so people can see that a little bit. Right. Those six, those bigger. openings are kind of intriguing. So if yeah. I had six of those, it would give it sort of a netted appearance a little bit. Uh huh. It might be interesting. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we will find out more of this on Friday. You have a couple of trays, I know, of full of um, fringe and mm -hmm. samples that we're going to talk about it. So <laughs> we'll take the first part to kind of talk about the, the fringe that you actually did on these pieces. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take that as a springboard to look at the fringes on your others. Would you, um, if I highlight your demo camera one more mm -hmm. time, I'm going to add it to the stream and highlight it. Will you uh, show the necklace that you're wearing? Sure. Uh, let's end. Let's end on that bit of lusciousness, shall we? Yeah, Donna's saying she's still waiting for a close up of <laughs> Emily's necklace. So let's let's take a look at it, if you don't okay. mind. No, no, not at all. Um, so we did the textured fringe bracelet a while back, um, and this is the exact same technique. I'm going to pull up just a little bit. Mm hmm. Uh, the exact same technique done with um, size 15 beads. And I made my own sort of beachy sandy mix. Mm -hmm. um, and I used a lot of different shaped beads for the fringe ends. Let right. Me, hold on. Let me reach back. Texture. So. So there's a project, if you guys haven't watched it, and I know many of you have actually made it, it's the beaded fringe bracelet. So you could translate this down to a bracelet or the bracelet up to this necklace. And this has two um, strands. So it's, it's, a, it's actually kind of weighty. Um, so it mm -hmm. has two strands of, of uh, fringe. Um, because I wanted it to be very lush, mm -hmm. which I think I accomplished. I agree. Right. And it's got a little mother of pearl. So I made uh, the pieces of soft flex simply are a loop of soft flex. So it goes from here through that centerpiece and back up and then it's crimped mm -hmm. off here. Um, so it's one piece of soft flex on each side. And this was just a, um, this old thing, just a, a, um, a piece of mother of pearl with holes on each mm -hmm. end. And I just ran the soft flex through it with the beads on um, and then texture did the textured fringe or the caterpillar technique um, mm -hmm. throughout. And, you know, I incorporated a very inexpensive little shell bead, um, mm -hmm. some very antique mercury glass beads. So these yeah, are they're really nice. Those ones are actually made the way your Christmas ornaments are made, right? It's a little blown glass bead that's hollow, and then it has the color on the inside. Oh, yeah, they're very pretty. Gita is asking here, and I put this up on the screen, sure. how long did this take to make? Several people are asking. Oh, I have um, no idea. Long time. It's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, 
one of those epic voyage projects. But you also have that bracelet right next to you that is yeah. the same, right? Just yeah, this is interpreted same, in done, different beads. Yeah, done with um, a little trade trade beads and with just, mm -hmm. I tried to use all striped beads because you guys know I have, well, maybe you don't know this, but I have a thing for striped beads, yeah. which I really like. Yeah, and it's like that Christmas bead kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, mixture. Yeah, really And we found pretty. these kind of pie-shaped beads, which I don't know if those are, are they're maybe sort of vintage-esque. So it's a triangle yeah. bead, but it's got the hole through the narrow end instead of the other end, which I kind of liked. I yeah. thought they were kind of cool. Yeah, they're really cool. It's black. a cool interpretation. Yeah. yeah. And again, you can go to the woven bracelet. I know a lot of you guys have made it um, from Emily's sample. So again, it's just scaling it up or scaling it down. I think this um, was actually the first one that I made. Mm -hmm. um, and the beads are a little bit bigger, but this is sort of the companion to the necklace. Um, mm -hmm. You know. Maybe and not. so you could you, you used you used 15s on the necklace, but mm -hmm. that one there, uh, your bracelet looks like those are 11s. Yeah. Yeah, 11s and 8s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can mix that up. Well, I think this is a great place to take a pause. Um, I'm going to go ahead, Em, and put you on uh, the front here. Let's put us together. There we are. All right. Well, this was good. And I've gotten, I've gotten quite a bit of this lariat done. So hopefully we will uh, play well, it's with it. It's a fun, yeah, I think it's good. So we'll see. Yeah. I'm almost to the back section. So yeah. we'll see how you know, it is. Um, the nice thing about putting those, those elements in the back, that little mirrored element, is that if you want to wear this, you could put them in the front and then wrap around and tie, and you'd have right. that little chunk in the front. It'd be pretty. Get out of my head, Emily Miller. It's a bead so, person thing. <laughs> that's right. Let me see if I can find the link, or somebody can link it. If you go under our projects section, uh, what was that called, M? Do you remember? Textured fringe. I'm, textured fringe. It might be under Seed Bead School actually under learning seed bead school yeah textured bead fringe i'm gonna go ahead and copy that and i'm gonna throw it in the um in the chat there um i think you guys will like it a lot i think it's a really fun project and there are um some really good episode notes on it that Drea wrote so you'll have a lot of support mm -hmm. um making making it's, that it's, one it's very it is technically not terribly difficult the beauty of it comes in the choice of your beads and the and the execution mm -hmm. you decide to do um, mm -hmm. you know technically it's not very difficult it's really mm -hmm. repeat repeat um, mm -hmm. And it's it's what you choose, how you sophisticated you choose to make that mixture of beads that, that really make adds, those beads. adds the um, uh, complexity to it. Oh, it's great. Well, it's a lot. Well, I cannot wait to see you. And let me put up a few little oh. closing closing shots here. So just a reminder for everybody, you can find all of the information on the project and products from today's broadcast on our website. You can go right to the live broadcast and find the one that says Hortensia. Um, uh, on Emily's project. And of course you can sign up for our newsletter for all the latest discounts, giveaways, and new products. And of course you can follow us on uh, at beadshop.com on our Instagram, um, at the bead table on our Facebook group. And of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss any content there. And I wanted to mention we're having a special uh, today. It's my Yuki mania today, Emily. So you use you use lots of Miyuki's in your pieces. So um, you can take off 20% uh, off of all of our Miyuki's in stock by using the coupon code Miyuki20 at checkout. And that is good 
only for today. Um, em, I'm going to go ahead and throw your Instagram back Thank up. You. It's covering the coupon code here for a second, but you can find Emily on Insta at Emily B. B. Miller Jewelry. And of course, if you are in local to the Sacramento area, Sacramento, California, you can go to, um, or you can just Google the Midtown Farmers Market in Sacramento and you'll find it because you'll see Emily there in person. So let me get these banners and things off so I can say a proper goodbye to you, Ms. Miller. Okay. And we'll be back I together on Friday. Can, I cannot wait till we can go to Ladies Lunch and Girl, see each other in person. I, it's been a long year. I am ready for that. We have our second shot in just a few weeks, and then yep. uh, slowly as things start to normalize, we're keeping our fingers crossed about that, um, we'll all be able to uh, to be together. So, um, all right. Well, I will all see right. you Friday, and thank you so much, everybody, for watching. It was great to have you, and we'll be back on Free Tip Friday for more uh, Fringe. 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 <laughs> See you Friday, everybody. Bye.